Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, um, my name is Marika. Um, I just wanted to welcome you all um, on behalf of the King's alumni team. Um, thank you all for being here, um, especially given the current situation. Um, it really means a lot to us. Uh, we are very excited to have a fantastic speaker lined up for you this evening. Um, so just a little bit about the format of the evening. Um, firstly, please note that this event is being live streamed. Um, so welcome to those of you watching from home as well. Um, in a moment, we'll hear a presentation from our guest speaker, Professor Anand Menon, uh, who will then be joined on stage by King's alumna, uh, Sam Mukhopadhyay, uh, who's going to kick off the Q&A section for us. Uh, so Sam completed a master's in forensic mental health at King's in 2015. Um, she now works in the civil service and has held roles in the Department for International Trade, the Cabinet Office, HMRC, and is currently working uh, at the Department for Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy. Um, so after the Q&A, we'll then open up to the audience for your questions. Um, so please save those till the end. Um, a little bit about our speaker, who I'm sure you're all familiar with already. Um, so we're joined this evening by King's resident Brexit expert, uh, Professor Anand Menon, who will provide us with his latest insights and perspectives on what might be in store for Britain um, and our place in Europe post-Brexit. Um, Anand is a professor of European politics and foreign affairs at King's. Since January 2014, he's served as director of the UK in a Changing Europe, uh, a research initiative based out of the Policy Institute at King's. Um, this award-winning research group's objective is to be the authoritative source for independent research on UK-EU relations. Um, so they provide high quality research to policymakers, businesses, journalists, educational institutions, and the general public. Um, Professor Menon has previously served as a special advisor to the House of Lords EU committee. Um, he's written widely on many aspects of EU politics and policy and on UK-EU relations and is frequently called upon to cast light on current affairs uh, on screen and in print. Please join me in welcoming Professor Anand Menon to the stage. Good evening. I think the first thing we're going to do is get rid of that photo. There we go. That feels a lot more comfortable already. Uh, I'm, I'm going to rattle through a few things. I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes and try and cover quite a lot of ground. Uh, not exhaustively, obviously, and the notion that there are easy answers to these things is simply fanciful because, you know, three and a half years on, there's still a staggering amount of uncertainty about Brexit and the direction it's going in. But things are starting to come into focus, I would say. Uh, if we talk about where we're at now in the process, we've obviously left the European Union, we have a withdrawal agreement in place, uh, and we're now starting to slide into the second phase negotiations about the future relationship. And of course, the government is insisting, and Michael Gove insisted uh, in front of a House of Commons committee uh, this week, that they will not extend transition. So transition, as far as the government is concerned, will end at the end of December this year, which means they have to wrap up their negotiations about the future by the end of this year. The EU was saying by October, but I think that's actually not true. They need to get it done by the end of this year uh, and get it ratified by both sides. Now, there are all sorts of problems with this, potentially. I mean, no one knows what's going to happen, but one of the problems is there's an awful lot to get done by the end of the year. I mean, coronavirus isn't even on that slide. Uh, and you could almost sort of superimpose it over the whole thing because, of course, that is eating up attention. And it's not just eating up attention, but, of course, it's potentially going to stop the talks taking place at all because the EU negotiators might not come here. Despite that, the government is insisting that it will not extend the transition phase. But apart from the fact there's an awful lot to be done, there's an awful lot that is very tricky to be done. Uh, and so, actually, one of the interesting things about this year is it is far from certain we're going to end up with any kind of deal at all. And there are several reasons from this. One is, if you're a cynic, you might think the government doesn't want to deal anyway. Uh, David Gork wrote an interesting piece on Conservative Home last weekend in which he was saying, actually, I think politically the government will be better off having no deal than a deal. We can come back to that in questions if you want, but I think I'm increasingly come to agree with that. But even if you assume that the government's preference would be to come out of these negotiations with a trade deal, 
it'll be far from simple. It'll be far from simple for several reasons. One, there are a whole lot of extraneous issues that might trip the whole thing up. The first of which, absurdly, is fish. And I say absurdly because the entire British fishing industry contributes less to our economy than Harrods. OK? <laughs> now, absurdity isn't limited to this side of the channel because the same is the case in France. The French are being equally absurd because they too are saying we might stop the whole talks because of fisheries. Uh, but this is about politics. It's always been about politics, our EU membership. The day before we signed our accession treaty, our then first ambassador to the European Union had to spend all night sitting up with the Conservative minister, going over a map of the United Kingdom, looking at constituencies and deciding which constituencies would be adversely affected by membership of the common fisheries policy. It was there at the beginning, it's gonna be there at the end. And whilst the economic value of the fishing industry is relatively small, in fact, incredibly small, the political importance of the fishing industry is absolutely huge. Moving on from fisheries, something else that might come up during these talks, given the state of politics in Spain at the moment, is that the Spanish Prime Minister, who is in quite a weak domestic position, and one of the problems they have in Spanish uh, politics at the moment is the rise of nationalist parties. If you put those things together and you're the Spanish Prime Minister, why would you not at some point in the Brexit process say, this is all great, but what about Gibraltar? All politicians think about their domestic audiences first, and given that the Spanish uh, Prime Minister is no different. It makes absolute political sense for him to say this because it ticks all the right boxes at home. The problem is it's a fiendishly difficult situation to try and sort out in negotiations with the British because neither side can easily afford to give ground. So on, on both sides there are issues that might come up in these talks, completely separate to the talks themselves in a way, flanking issues that might trip things up. And if you think about the negotiations themselves, there are several things that are potentially problematic. The first is this notion that the EU has of level playing field. Now, the EU's negotiating position in many ways is as overblown, as exaggerated, as unreasonable as ours. One of the things the EU is saying is, look, you're leaving the European Union, that's fine. But incidentally, if you want a trade deal, you have to be, continue to be bound by our rules on state aid Oh, and incidentally, it'll be our court that decides whether you're in breach or not. To which, not unreasonably, the British government replies, we're leaving. The whole point of leaving is not to be under your laws and not to be under your court. So how can you make a condition of the future relationship be that we are under your law and under your court? So compromise is necessary. Compromise will be quite hard to find at the best of times in negotiations like this, but at a time when politics is leading the way over economics, very, very obviously, and increasingly so on both sides of the channel, it is problematic to say the least. The other thing I would say about this trade deal that means it'll be a hard one to sign up to is this. This is the only negotiation in history whose sole purpose is to make trade more difficult. OK? What that means is there are precious few wins economically to sell at home to parliamentarians or the public. So even if we get a deal, ratification, and remember the European Parliament has to ratify this, if the deal is what they call a mixed agreement, all national parliaments in the European Union have to ratify this, it is far from certain in my book that that kind of ratification will be forthcoming. So I think there is a pretty good chance during the course of this year that the negotiations break up. I think in a curious kind of way, uh, coronavirus makes it easier for the government to do this. Because if I come on to, I'm gonna come on and talk about the economic impacts of Brexit. If those economic impacts are politically unclear, are, are unclear, if you can say, well, actually, that's not Brexit, that's coronavirus, it makes it easier to do. And if you think that, and again, I'll talk about this in a minute, that the deal that the prime minister is trying to get is a relatively thin deal, that is to say, what, even what he's after is not that much in terms of an economic relationship with the European Union. And if you think, therefore, the gap economically between de de deal and no deal is relatively small, why would the Prime Minister sign his name onto a deal that means economic pain, where the alternative is to have no deal and blame the EU for everything that goes wrong thereafter? So politically, there are rationales for walking away from the table. This is not to say that the EU's position is... Flawless. One of the things I'll say about the European Union is there is a real and profound 
tension at the heart of its position, because on the one hand, if we're talking about security cooperation, and there's a lot of security cooperation between us and the European Union, the European Commission says, look, face it, once you've left, you're a third country like any other, you're not special, you're not unique, so we will cooperate with you in exactly the same way as we cooperate with any other third country. The British are saying, but on security it's different, the EU is saying, no, you're a bog standard third country. When it comes to the economics, however, when the British government says, we want to be treated like Japan or Canada or anyone else you've signed a trade deal with, the EU say, yeah, but you're exceptional. You're absolutely not a bog standard third country. You are Britain, and we have to treat you differently to everyone else. Why? Because you're close and you're a big economy, and so you're a threat to our manufacturers. So we can't possibly treat you in the same way as we would treat Japan or Canada. So even the heart of the EU position, and there's nothing wrong with this, we're open about it. This is about interest, not about principles. The problem with the EU side is they talk as if it's all about principles, whereas in actuality it's not. It's about defending your interests. So both sides, if you like, are playing a game with each other, and that game is one which makes it quite difficult to see how this thing ends with a satisfactory solution, which is a deal by the end of this year. So what will that mean? Let me start by talking very briefly about economic forecasts. Economic forecasts have been one of the, of public faith in economic forecasts has been one of the victims of the Brexit process. And it's been one of the victims because economic forecasts have been woefully misused by politicians. And now I'm talking about George Osborne and not anything that has happened since the referendum. In, in April 2016, the Treasury produced some forecasts about what would happen to the British economy immediately after a vote to leave the European Union. And what those forecasts essentially said was there'll be about 50,000 job losses, the British economy will slip immediately into recession. And of course, this didn't happen. Those forecasts have become the leave voters' best friend. Because whenever someone says leaving the European Union will be bad for the economy, they hold up that forecast and say, you were wrong then, you're wrong now. That is a logical non sequitur. Let me try to explain to you why. Short-term economic forecasts are a particular form of forecasting, and they are particularly dodgy. Because short-term economic forecasting is an attempt to predict how lots of people will react to an economic stimulus, uh, and involves you making a lot of heroic assumptions about human behavior. In April 2016, the Treasury thought, if we vote to leave the European Union, businesses will immediately cease investment and panic, and the general public will go into lockdown, much as we're about to go into lockdown now. They'll stop spending because I think, oh my God, what does this mean? They were wrong. What happened was businesses took about a year to realize that the Brexit vote was serious. For about 12 months after the referendum, business continued as normal because the CBI thought, politicians will fix this. We're not really going to leave. We'll figure it out. We'll end up looking like Norway. It'll be fine. Okay. Meanwhile, the general public thought, the sun's out. There's a European championship going on. We're going to buy beer and burgers. And they did. And consumer confidence actually did not dip at all during that summer of 2016. And so the predictions proved to be false. The predictions I'm about to talk about, not predictions, the forecasts I'm about to talk about are very different. These aren't forecasts about how human individuals will behave. They are forecasts about what happens to economies if you make trade harder. And these are forecasts based on literally 100 years of data from around the world. And most of the figures I'm about to show you are the government's own forecasts, which, whilst many ministers in the government don't believe them, are still the government's forecasts. And anyway, I'll go through them now and you can see what you think. The first thing that has to be said about Brexit is the economic damage is already happening. Uh, if economists take what they've always taken to try and make estimates about how the British economy is functioning, a bunch of countries whose combined economic performance has generally been pretty similar to that of the United Kingdom. So if you take that doppelganger and compare it to the performance of the UK economy since the referendum, the finding is that the British economy is already in the order of 2 to 2.5% 2 smaller than it would have been had we voted to remain. That is because largely of lost investment. A lot of companies who might have been thinking of investing in the United Kingdom are thinking, let's just hang on and see where this ends up before we pile millions of pounds into the UK economy. It will be good to know if you're a car manufacturer whether or not you can make cars in the, Europe, in the United Kingdom and sell them easily in the European Union without having to have them checked for regulatory compliance, without having to pay tariffs, all that sort of stuff. So the economic impacts are already starting to happen. Uh, more significantly, 
is the fact that all credible forecasts of the economic impacts of Brexit show that it will be negative. Now, there are several things about this that I want you to note. The bits under the line, actually, you can ignore for the moment, though note that the government's old modelling shows that leaving the single market and the customs union will have negative economic impacts. Let me say in parentheses, there are some things that are more important than economics. It is a perfectly credible point of view to say, actually, I'll take an economic hit. I don't want the European Parliament having a say over, over the laws I'm governed under. Okay, So this isn't an argument to say that if you think sovereignty is more important than short-term economic pain, that's a bad argument. This is simply making the point that there are economic consequences to be had from this process. But look above the line. Above the line are the forecasts about the gains to be had from A, being able to regulate our economy independently of the European Union. And the crucial thing here is the gains to be had from re regulating independently are there because actually a lot of you, EU regulation is rubbish. It's overcomplicated, it's too long because 28 member states have to agree it. But the benefits of doing it better are outweighed by the costs of losing access to 27 markets. That's the trade-off with regulation. But equally importantly, the bits above the line include the projected economic benefits of signing trade deals with all those countries down the bottom. Trade deals with countries that are far, far away geographically will not compensate for the loss of trade with your nearest and largest trading partner. Okay? Think about it this way. We make cars. BMW makes cars in Oxford. Some parts for BMW cars cross the channel seven, eight, nine, ten times during the manufacturing process. They do so without checks. They do so without tariffs because we're in the single market in the customs union. We're not going to replace that making cars with New Zealand. It simply takes too long to ship the parts. It's too unpredictable. Weather gets in the way. There are transport costs. Geography helps significantly to determine our trade patterns. And the European Union is our nearest and largest trading partner. So, yes, we can sign trade deals with, people, with countries around the world. Yes, it might make a difference. Yes, we might invent new technologies that actually make this obsolete and mean that trading around the world is as easy as trading next door. But for the moment, that is simply not the case. Now, the big question going forward, I'm going to talk about this a little bit because I'm a political scientist, not an economist, and the politics is what fascinates me, is what does all this mean for the politics? And there, the answer becomes very, very fuzzy indeed. Firstly, let me just show you these numbers. These are the numbers from our forecast. So the, the aggregate numbers about the impact of Brexit on our economy are large. If we're talking between 3 and 7% of GDP, we're talking billions of pounds. So I'm not for a moment suggesting that the losses are insignificant, but the impact is aggregate and will take place over a long period of time. And if you look at that, the, bottom, the green and blue lines on the bottom chart are people who think leaving the European Union was the right decision or the wrong decision. And what you'll see is there's been a slight flutter towards wrong decision over, over the course of 2019. But actually, those lines are essentially pretty straight. Very few people change their minds about Brexit since the referendum. Okay? And in fact, insofar as people did change their minds, what the evidence suggests is that that change is largely made up of people who didn't or couldn't vote in 2016, deciding they would vote Remain if there was another referendum. Very few Leavers are now Remainers. Very few Remainers are now Leavers. And that is despite the fact that more and more people think that Brexit will be damaging to the British economy. I, this isn't about economics necessarily. There are a lot of people who think, OK, there's an economic hit. It's a price worth paying. I'd rather be out and face that hit than in. So the politics of the economics of Brexit from the start is pretty unclear. Bear in mind, too, that the economic impact of Brexit doesn't hit us on the 1st of January next year. It will take place over time. Car manufacturers won't suddenly think, right, forget it, I'm going to shut down my car manufacturing factory now. They might say, OK, look, we can't trade with Europe. We've got a production line going now. Let's get to the end of that production line and not invest in four years' time. So if you want, a lot of people talk about cliff edges when it comes to Brexit, and I think that's a particularly bad analogy. If you want an analogy for Brexit, I think a better one is, a, I don't know how many of you cycle, but a slow puncture on your bike. And the thing about a slow puncture is, firstly, it takes you ages to notice you've got it. So maybe five years down the line, people will think, hang on a sec, France looks quite prosperous. We're not doing so well. What is it? So it's slow and it's subtle. But the second thing 
about slow punctures is you can never, ever remember where you pick them up. And if you have lots of stuff going on at the same time, it is not necessarily obvious that any economic impact is down to Brexit. I refer you to COVID-19. Anything that happens to the British economy over the 12, next 12 months that is negative will be put down to COVID-19 and not Brexit, even if there is a significant Brexit effect bundled up inside that. So politically, it's a more subtle story than the economists would have you believe. But at the same time, and I think this is equally important, politics is changing. And politics is changing because of the outcome of the last election and the politics that that implies. So think back to the referendum. That's the map of the referendum vote. Uh, the yellow areas are remain, the blue areas are leave. And I don't know if you remember uh, when Rory Stewart said he was stepping down as an MP and standing as Mayor of London. He was interviewed, I think, by The Standard, and they said to him, Rory, what's your favourite pub in London? And Rory, Rory's a bit odd, let's face it, said Pret, OK? <laughs> which, is, which is, at best, a curious answer to that question, but there we go, that's Rory for you. And... Then the next thing that happened that was really curious was loads of sort of Corbyn outriders on Twitter started attacking Rory for being an elitist metropolitan, you know, individual because he liked Pret. And I thought this is all a bit curious. And then in the office, they did some digging around with the data and they came up with this diagram. They're the locations of the Prets in the United Kingdom. And actually, <laughs> what, what you suddenly see is, wow, there, you know, there's something going on there after all. Uh, and Pret is a cipher for stuff, OK? Pret base themselves in certain parts of the country where certain sorts of people live. If you want to put it this way, the big, successful metropolitan cities in this country tend to be more highly educated, younger, and uh, they tend to earn more, OK? And they're the places where there are Pret. So there's something socioeconomic going on in this country. And in fact, if you want to pass that, the real issue in this country is there are severe geographical inequalities when it comes to economic performance. We have inequalities in this country regionally that are of a scale of those seen across the Eurozone as a whole. So one of the striking things about this is this is what politics is all about now. If you think about yesterday's budget, if you think about the rhetoric about levelling up, the Johnson government is talking about dealing with the economic issues that came to light because of the vote in the Brexit referendum, which I think is a good thing, quite frankly. That is inexcusable, and that has been in the situation in our country for the best part of the last two decades. It's just that before the referendum, politically, no one had an incentive to think about it. All of a sudden now, because of the referendum, we have a very strong incentive to think about it. But there are challenges here. There are challenges for the Conservatives because they won. That's the, red, the famous Red Wall. They won seats that used to be held by the Labour Party. These are seats that tend to have lower median incomes than the traditional Tory seat. And they're also constituencies that have higher levels of manufacturing than your traditional Conservative seat. Now, levelling up the country is a massive task that under the best of circumstances you could not hope to do in one parliamentary term. But, and here's the rub as I move towards a conclusion, it becomes all the more difficult given Brexit because, ironically enough, there is an almost perfect correlation between how strongly a region in the United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union and how dependent that region is economically on trade with the European Union. So to put it another way, the two regions of the United Kingdom that voted most strongly to uh, remain were London and Scotland, and they are the two regions of the United Kingdom who economically are least dependent on trade with the European Union. So the government is launching a levelling up agenda at a time when resources are going to be strapped, if only because of COVID-19. That's going to have a massive impact on the public finances going forward. Some people are already estimating this impact might be as great as that of the financial crisis. And secondly, at a time when the very sort of Brexit that the government is, is planning to bring about is going to increase the kinds of inequality that it has said it is its objective to deal with. So there are real challenges ahead. Now, the government's calculation is the aggregate effects that I talked about before, the, the, you know, the average voter will not notice. If we start investing in high streets in the north, opening up boarded up shops, cleaning up parks, dealing with potholes, that will be electorally more significant than anything to do with the macro effects of Brexit that will be subtle and slow to appear. I don't know whether that, that gamble works or not. All I know is it is a very, very bold one and a very, very risky one, particularly given what's happening to the economy now.
So in a sense, one of the most important conclusions about Brexit is it's not about relations with the European Union at all. It's been a process of breaking the political mold in this country, of changing the political debate. Who would have imagined four years ago we would have a conservative government that was obsessed with leveling up the economy and spending more to decrease inequality by investments in the north of the country? So the nature of our politics has been one of the biggest things that has changed as a result of that referendum. And in a sense, you can conceptualize this as politics taking precedence over economics, whether it's in terms of, in, of immigration policy, whether it's in terms of Brexit policy. What this government says is, we want to be in control, and we want to take back control, and if, if that has economically negative impacts, we're willing to take them because it is delivering on political promises that matter. However, and the final thing I'll say is, delivering on those promises in the context we're going to see over the next two to three years is going to be very, very difficult indeed. Thank you very much. Sorry, that was me. Okay, so I'm going to keep an eye on the time. I know we started a little bit late, um, so I do apologize for being a typical millennial and having my phone on me, uh, but I am timing it. Um, so I think the first thing I wanted to ask you was, um, given everything that we've just heard, what do you anticipate to be what's going to happen in the next three years first? <laughs> Easy question. Okay, this is obviously nothing more than a hunch. If you force me to bet, I suspect there won't be a deal done this year. Uh, if only because one of the striking things about where we are now is the gap between a deal and no deal has narrowed massively since the time of Theresa May. Okay? Under Theresa May, you had a far deeper trading relationship with the Northern Ireland backstop, and no deal meant no withdrawal agreement, which meant chaos in Ireland. Okay, so the gap was big. Mm. Now you have a deal which is a very thin FTA on goods only, okay, nothing to do with services. So it's a far less on Sorry, offer. Sorry, can you expand what the well, thin FTA what the, and the, the thick sort FTA of deal is. that Boris Johnson is talking about is basically a, a, a deal that scraps all tariffs on goods. It has nothing to do with services. It is far less far reaching than the deal that Theresa May negotiated. So the deal on offer offers far less to the British economy than the deal that was on offer under Theresa May. And at the same time, no deal is not as bad, mm. because no deal doesn't mean we don't know what we're doing with Ireland, because we have a withdrawal agreement that has decided what we do with Ireland. No deal simply means no trade deal. So the gap between the two is narrower. And if you think, OK, even under the deal that Boris Johnson wants, there is going to be a little bit of disruption at our ports in January because we're still going to have to have checks. We're still going to have to have regulatory clearances. Dover and other ports will not work any longer the way they do now. And there'll be a political cost with comes, that comes with that. So I suspect that there are at least some people in Downing Street who are thinking, so we have a choice. We can sign a deal that leads to some disruption, and we have to own that disruption because we signed the deal. Mm. Or we can go away with no deal, in which case we can simply blame all the disruption on the unreasonable Europeans who refuse to sign a deal with us. And I, there is part of me that thinks politically, actually, the latter course makes a lot more sense because mm. wrapping yourself in the flag, saying they did this to us, walking away... And the combination of that and COVID explaining anything, so it's either the European Union or it's a disease, and then investing in these communities mm. via borrowing, mm -hmm. that politically might well work. I don't think this is a recipe for electoral failure in four years' time by any means. No. Yeah. But what's really interesting is it's been a very conservative, heavy government for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and given that it's more about politics as opposed to economics, do you feel like, for a lot of people, that rhetoric can only last for so long? Us versus them. I mean, and, as, you know, yeah. it's about our sovereignty. As, as Boris Johnson said during the, uh, immediately after the election, there is a sense that a lot of those traditional Labour voters in those red wall seats lent the Conservatives their vote. And we don't know what happens to those votes. We mm. don't know whether these are Labour voters who just couldn't vote for Jeremy Corbyn or there are Labour voters who decided there was something about Boris Johnson they liked, or there were Labour voters who voted for Boris Johnson because of Brexit and immediately mm. vote Labour again, whoever becomes a new Labour leader. That we don't know. But I think what Boris Johnson has on his side is in a lot of these constituencies, they are places where they haven't seen government 
since the 1980s, and then what government did was close down the, the mines and, and manufacturing industry and left them bereft of industry or a functioning economy. So if a government turns up that is willing to say, we're shifting a bit of the British Library to Leeds, we're having a West Yorkshire mayor, we're going to invest in your town centre, the sums involved might be relatively trivial compared to the aggregate economics of the impact mm. of trade, but they will be politically massively significant. Mm. Finally, we've got a government that is willing to do something about it. Might be a compelling message. Obviously, there are lots of variables. It depends on whether the government is seen to be competent in its handling mm. of the pandemic now, and it depends on how many job losses there are, which I think is fundamental. Uh, mm. But it's not a wholly irrational political strategy, no. I don't think. No. And I suppose that lends into a really interesting question about devolved administrations. How do you see, apart from COVID-19, how do you see the next couple of months playing out and how we devolve and how the Northern Ireland Protocol has an impact on what's going to happen in this transition period? Okay, well, there's devolution and, de I mean, I come from West Yorkshire, so devolution to me now is the West, it's about the West Yorkshire mayor and not about Scotland, but that's purely personal sort of, but, and incidentally, the West Yorkshire Mayor is such a bad idea. There should be a Yorkshire Mayor, and it's a complete rip-off, but we can talk about that in questions if you want. Uh, when it comes to Northern Ireland, there will be checks hmm. under the protocol. There have to be checks under the protocol because the European Union... Northern Ireland essentially remains inside the customs territory of the European Union and inside the European Union's single market as far as goods is concerned. The one thing the European Union doesn't do is decide not to care what enters its market. And that for two reasons. One, because they're worried about health and safety, chlorinated chicken, we might be shipping them stuff that they think is unsafe. But probably the more powerful reason is manufacturers. French manufacturers do not want to see us shipping things to Northern Ireland that either don't meet their standards or are cheaper because they haven't been checked. And those things then getting from the Republic into the European market and undercutting their producers. And for that reason alone, they will insist that the checks are carried out at the Northern Ireland border. And if it seems that the government hasn't implemented the protocol properly, we will end up, in the sweetest of ironies, in front of the European Court of Justice early next calendar year. That's the first thing they'll do. Scotland, if you want to, do you want to know about Scotland? Scotland is, is a completely different kettle. And Wales. Wales, mm -hmm. I mean, Wales is, is sort of, Wales, there are issues, but they're less immediate than in Scotland. Because, of course, in Scotland, what we see now for the first time is polls showing a majority for independence. And the majority for independence comes from the fact that a lot of l Remain voters in Scotland have gone from being independent skeptics to being independent supporters because of Brexit. Brexit has had a massive impact on Scotland. And if you like, Brexit has made the case of independence emotionally more attractive for people in Scotland. Why? The English are dragging us out of the European Union against our will. Theresa May never listened to anything we said. They completely ignored us, were completely sidelined. Basically, Brexit is a narrative of the English are bastards, and that plays well with a significant part of the population in Scotland, OK? The problem for the SNP, apart from the Alex Salmond court case, which is a potentially massive problem, and depending on how that goes, that, will, that is, will determine the short-term future of the SNP more than anything else. But the other problem for the independence camp in Scotland is this. If they decide to vote for independence and join the European Union, mm. for precisely the reasons we were talking about with Northern Ireland, mm. because there'll be no protocol for Scotland, there will have to be a hard customs and regulatory border between Scotland and England. And for most people in this country, I think, including many people who are in favour of Scottish independence, the notion of having that sort of border between Scotland and England is pretty much unthinkable. And the SNP are yet to come up with an effective or compelling answer to that dilemma. Mm. And I think that is something they're going to have to address if they want to win that referendum. Do you, when do you think that will be part of the zeitgeist? When do you think we'll start even talking about it? Well, I think there are several stages, aren't there? The first is they have to get, get through the stage of managing to have agreement for a referendum, because in this country, Westminster has to agree for there to be a referendum, and the government has said that they won't. Now, if the SNP win a thumping victory in the Scottish elections next year, the pressure on the government in Westminster, I think, will become mm. unbearable, and they might have to give in. But I think that the attention of the SNP at the moment is on getting through that hurdle, making sure they win that election. Now, one of the interesting things about the SNP is there are factions. 
So there's one faction that says, ignore the government in Westminster, let's just do a Catalan, have a referendum. If they want to call it independent, if they want to call it illegal, that's fine. But if we get a majority for independence, what are they going to do about it? But the more cautious camp, of which Nicola Sturgeon is part, are saying, no, we do this by due process, and if we have to be patient, we should be mm. patient. Wales. Wales, well, I mean, Welsh politics is shifting. There's mm. a certain disillusionment with the Labour Party, and the Labour Party won't be exactly thrilled by its performance in uh, the last election. But one of, the, I mean, in a sense, one of the things that's afflicting Labour at the moment is the Scottish issue is mm. becoming an issue for Labour all over the country. And by, what I mean by the Scottish issue is this perception that there are parts of the country where Labour just have a sense of entitlement. The kind of, well, of course they're going to vote for us. Who the hell else are they going to vote for? That was the situation in Scotland where, you know, Labour, Labour MPs took it for granted, didn't turn up in their constituencies very often at all, and were punished by the rise of the SNP. It's mm -hmm. happening to them a bit in Wales. It happened to them again in West Yorkshire. I mean, you think about West Yorkshire, the only reason Yvette Cooper and Ed Miliband are still in Parliament is because of Nigel Farage where the Brexit party got more votes than the margin of victory over the Conservatives. So across the country, I think, Labour is facing a really significant crisis of yeah. faith and trust of its traditional electorates. The other thing about Labour, which is a, a, a Brexit issue, is this. Brexit is an issue of values, not of political ideology. Mm -hmm. So Brexit isn't about the left-right divide in politics. It's about whether you are socially liberal or socially conservative. In general, and it's an aggregate, and there are always exceptions, socially conservative people voted for Brexit, socially liberal people voted for Remain, okay? What the Conservatives have emerged with from the 2019 election is a relatively coherent values coalition of social conservatives, mm. more or less. I mean, there are still social liberals amongst, uh, you know, there are still Remain-minded social liberals who voted conservative, some of them because they couldn't conceive of Jeremy Corbyn in number 10. But in the main, the, the conservative coalition is relatively homogenous. Labour is split down the middle on values. If you think about it, the people of Wigan have a completely different view on social values than the people in Keir Starmer's constituency. And one of the issues I think that Labour might have to face over the next four years is if the Conservatives start to push on the social values issue, yeah. let's talk about immigration, let's talk about integrating immigrant communities, let's talk about gender equality, let's talk about trans rights, which is already starting to bubble away in the Labour Party, the Conservative coalition will hold because they're basically on the same side of that divide. The danger for the Labour Party is they start to tear apart. And if you look at what happened in Germany, okay, where the Social Democratic Party has basically died because the sort of liberal, bourgeois, city-dwelling mm. SPD voters now vote green, and the traditional working-class SPD supporters now vote either for the extreme left or the extreme right, and that party has sort of disappeared from, from German politics. What saves the Labour Party from that is our electoral system. And our electoral system pushes you towards supporting one of the two big parties, but that value issue can still be absolutely fatal mm. to Labour if they play it badly and the Conservatives mm. play it well. Now, I suppose my last question would then be, who are the real winners and losers out of all of this? Well, the clear winner of Brexit at the moment strikes me as being Boris Johnson, who, before this whole saga, if you'd said Boris Johnson will be a very powerful Prime Minister with a significant majority who is essentially unchallenged by the opposition that is busy staring at its own navel, uh, people would have thought you were mad. Uh, the distributional impacts of Brexit will be very interesting. We don't know what they are yet, but I would say one thing about the Conservative Party is there are still Conservatives in the Conservative Party, and those Conservatives join the Conservative Party because they believe in a small state and low taxation. And it would be very interesting to know what those people think in four years' time if we see a Conservative government that spends four years taxing people to raise money to create a bigger state to invest in the North. That isn't what many traditional Tory voters joined the Conservative Party to see. And whether that is manageable or not will be one of the questions that determines mm. what happens in the next election. What I will say, though, is the one defining feature of Conservatives over the last 30 or 40 years has been their intense pragmatism and their ability to compromise if they understand that actually the price is power. Uh, but again, whether the parliamentary party will hold together at a time when the Conservatives seem to be moving away from what they have stood for in my lifetime is going to be a very interesting political question. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think this is a good time to ask questions from the audience. OK. Already see a couple of hands over there. So we'll take one over there, one over there. 
That's all right. Mike's coming to you. Uh, it's not quite Brexit related, but the idea that levelling up is sort of a new policy, uh, how different do you see it to sort of ideas about the northern powerhouse that came before it pre-referendum? Well, the new Labour tried it as well. Uh, it's not new. People have known the problem. Uh, the problem manifests itself not just in terms of GDP per capita, but the gap in productivity across this country is absolutely staggering. Your average worker in the southeast is far more productive than your average German worker. Your average worker in the northwest is far less productive than your average German worker. So there are all sorts of things. We've known about it. Uh, the northern powerhouse never really got going. It was a slogan in search of both funding and political attention. Uh, so... We don't really, you know, it's, it's almost, you can't tell because it was an idea that wasn't tried particularly. Uh, what is obvious and what is clear from what any economist will say is that levelling up is not a four-year project. It's more like a 15-year project because it involves not just, you know, sticking a bit of investment into Wigan High Street and making people feel better about their, their town. It involves investment in human capital. It involves better skills training. It involves doing something we're very bad at in this country, which is thinking what you do with non-university higher education. Uh, how, do you, how do you train people who aren't going to university so that they can get good, fulfilling, profitable jobs? Uh, so I think we have a, the problem is bigger than it is now. No government has sustained interest in this for long enough to really figure out the degree to which it is possible. But what I would say is the most that you can expect from one parliamentary term is sort of tokenistic advances. But as I said, for people in those places where they don't feel government has paid any attention at all to them for a long, long time, that in itself might be worth something. This is partly, I think a lot of people, the sense I get talking to Labour voters who switched to the Conservatives in the last election is it's almost a sort of cry for attention as much as it is anything else. It is kind of like, you know, it's about time you thought about us. And actually, the fact of showing that you are thinking about them might be as important as the results in some ways. Okay. Gentleman over there. Hi. Yeah, it sort of follows on that question. You talked about the effect politically of um, ports and maybe car factories suffering and being able to blame that on the European Union. How far do you think that really survives if people who lent their votes to the Conservatives are laid off from Washington, Toyota factory and out of Dover? Can they really hold that line? Well, I mean, the honest answer is I don't know. Uh, because, I mean, if you, think, if you take the car industry specifically, it is ab I think that the future of the car industry in this country would be in doubt even without Brexit for a combination of reasons, whether it's diesel gate, the shift to electric, whether it is employment and labor costs in this country compared to either Slovakia or Turkey. The fact that now that Japan has a trade deal with the European Union, the Japanese have an incentive to take car production home because they can, they can export to the European Union a lot more easily without needing to base production here. So the future of the car industry was uncertain anyway. Brexit adds another layer of uncertainty to that. So if I were the government, I would say, well, look, the fact is this car industry wasn't going to stay here for much longer anyway. Uh, Brexit might have speeded that up, but actually now you've got a government that's committed, we will deal with the process of adaptation. So part of it depends on the speed of job losses. You're absolutely right. Job losses will have an impact politically. Part of it depends on the reaction to job losses. That is to say, if the government were to put out a plan saying, here are the manufacturing heavy areas of the United Kingdom, our Brexit policy is going to have an impact on those. Here are our plans to invest either in companies to give tax incentives to companies to go there and employ local people or in training local people so they can reskill themselves and get different jobs. It is not inconceivable that you can ride your way through that storm. Uh, it partly depends on how big an issue it is by the next election. It partly, of course, all of this also partly depends on what the Labour Party look like under their new leader and how effective they are. I had a question over here, the lady over here. So lady in blue. She would have hand up first. Thank you very much. Okay, in the face of a no deal, <clears throat> where do you think we should be investing our money um, to survive the best we can? In the face of? In the, in the face of a no deal, in, 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 if there is a no deal, where do you think the government should be investing money in what services and industries to make the best of a bad job? Quick answer. You, well, 
We need to invest in a lot of infrastructure type things. So it's the need to hire more customs officers. It's the need to have you know more than six lorry parking bays at Dover because lorries are going to have to stack there. Uh, it's the need to invest in new agencies to deal with the environment in areas where the European Union used to do with this. We have to invest. We have to figure out the best way to invest in areas where the EU used to invest for us. So we talk about agriculture, we talk about fisheries, yeah, regional sorry, spending. I was, I was thinking more in terms of economic development and economic, <laughs> in terms of new industries, what, what's your hunch about how we could invest to make the best I mean, to be honest, my hunch is as good as someone else's and probably not as good as a 20-year-old's because I don't really understand technology and I suspect that's the future. I mean, I don't know. I mean, what is curious is the party that historically said the state is no good at picking winners is now going to be engaged in doing just that by intervening in the economy. Now, the evidence suggests that the, the impact of that is patchy at best. I think a lot of the stuff, I mean, the stuff I sort of know something about, which is the stuff about the talk of, of levelling up, I think a lot of the direction of travel there is sensible, which is to say infrastructure, transport links, and things like that. I mean, I'll, I'll say one thing about HS2. HS2 has been badly sold and badly named because speed is irrelevant. This isn't about being able to get to London 15 minutes quicker from Birmingham or 20 minutes quicker from Leeds. This is about opening up capacity so that local trains in those regions can work better and more effectively. If you've ever got the train from Leeds to Manchester, it takes a hell of a lot longer than it should, and it's a repurposed bus, literally. Uh, so investing in infrastructure in the north and joining the north up better would work very well. In terms of industries, I wouldn't even like to hazard a guess. Uh, I'm so preoccupied at getting my football predictions wrong that predicting the state of the so economy is... So, sorry, we just need to... I don't, we you don't think get... we have a US... You don't think we have a US in any area? I think we have strengths in lots of areas. We have strengths in high-value manufacturing. We have strengths in aerospace. We have strengths in uh, car manufacturing. We have strengths in fintech. We have strengths in technology. We have strengths in financial services. Whether I think government investment can help that more than, say, in the case of fintech, restrictive immigration policies that prevent the people they depend on coming here to work will hurt, harm them, I'm not entirely convinced. Okay, we've got a question over there. Yeah, given how small the marginal gains were of doing trade outside of Europe, uh, what do you think the prospects are of reshoring? Uh, and how do you think uh, we will face the challenge of Brexit by looking at artificial, inten artificial intelligence and, and reshoring some of those uh, manufacturing good services in the UK? Is well, that an opportunity? I mean, reassuring is cl clearly something that's happening in the United States at the moment because the government is making it quite clear that that's what it wants from US companies. There is a little bit of anecdotal evidence that it's happening here. Uh, then again, there are counterexamples like Dyson, that actually Brexit is making people flee for a whole mm. variety of reasons. So. It is almost too soon to say, and will depend not just on the detailed nature of whatever Brexit deal we get. So if we get a nice deal that looks good for tariffs in manufacturing, there might be incentives. Uh, of course, the, the, the tighter the trade relationships we end up with with the countries in which those industries are now, the lower the incentives to reshore, because actually the easier trade becomes with them. On AI, uh, as far, I mean, again, you know, God, I'm someone, I, I wrote my master's thesis on a typewriter and I was perfectly happy with that. So, uh, you know, uh, it is clearly an area where the state needs to invest. It is equally an area where I suspect government won't really know what it's doing because it simply doesn't have the expertise to do it wisely. Um, I'm very conscious of time. So what I'm going to do is take sets of three. Okay. We can note them down and if we can answer them, okay. that might be easier. I've got one question over there, one here, and another over there. So if we take... Lady in yellow, lady over here, and lady back there. Um, thanks for everything that you've shared with us this evening. Um, I think the idea of infrastructure, which seems to be predominantly transport infrastructure, is not really going to help. Um, it is simply going to have the effect of enabling people to get to London quicker. That's my belief. London is too big and too important in the economy. We have one of the most unbalanced economies of Europe. I can't see a Tory government doing anything much to invest in small firms, uh, you know, that, 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 that are good at innovating. I can't see them investing in education. You suggested that we need a far, far broader approach to education than just university training in this country. I can't see a Tory government doing that. 
my own feeling is a pretty bleak time ahead. Um, I, if you can find any way of giving me some cause for optimism. <laughs> I know that's a big ask, but I'd be really grateful. Fab. Lydia here. My question is more um, of a global one, I suppose, rather than just um, um, a UK-centric um, position in the sense that I see, um, okay, Brexit is kind of like a lens or a magnifying glass on um, the um, political um, tension across the world between those who feel they've been left behind mm -hmm. um, f from globalization. And Britain isn't any different, really, from what's happening across, you know, lots of European countries as well, the US, we see it in many countries. And I'd just be interested in your view as to whether or not there's anything different. Um, what's happening in the UK, I mean, Brexit may, may exaggerate that, but whether or not in terms of the pol politics, um, you know, there seems to be no room for um, centre parties now. It seems to be one of extremes. Um, and I'd be interested in your views on that. And lady over there. And my question really is a slightly a historical one. I always like to look at root causes, you know, in order to try and work out what should happen going forward. But uh, over the years, when you travel through Europe, you know, you'd arrive at an airport and it would say, built by the European Union. You'd drive down a road and it would say, funds from the European Union. And there'd be European Union flags everywhere. And in, meanwhile, in the UK, you said that the communities that benefited most from trade with Europe were the ones that voted against it. And my question really is, where did the European project go wrong? Where Britain is concerned, why didn't we fly blue flags and why weren't we proud to sell the benefits of what Europe did for us? Okay, thank you. But so, Let me do with the last one first. Uh, well, Part of it, I think, isn't where the European project went wrong. I think part of it is if you talk to people in, say, the Welsh Valleys or whatever, there's a lot of EU funding went in. There are a lot of blue sort of plaques saying this is EU funding. I th the predominant feeling is why should we need handouts? Why can't we have a functioning economy that works without handouts? So it's more profound than that. Uh, the, there's a sense of resentment in places that you have to get, you know, checks from the European Union that build you a railway museum or a bridge, but there are no decent jobs. Now, it wasn't the European Union's job, in a way, to give them decent jobs, but I think there was a lot of that bundled up in the 2016 vote. However, I mean, going back to the country back across the world, for, it wasn't predominantly left-behind voters that voted for Brexit. I mean, that narrative has caught on, and you see that it's had a massive political impact because the government seems to be saying, we have to deal with these voters because of the Brexit vote. The majority of people who voted Brexit were relatively affluent Conservative voters, not relatively badly off Labour voters, okay? Significantly more than 50% of the Brexit votes. Uh, but you're absolutely right that there is that sense of disquiet, and it isn't just European. I mean, the precursor to Brexit was Modi, uh, with a slightly nativist, anti-globalization, anti-expert, uh, Indians first sort of rhetoric. That was the precursor. But this, this is happening across the world. It's happening across the world for a number of reasons. I think partly, mainly, because politics failed a lot of people and became complacent. I think that's absolutely the case, that the sort of the insiders who were doing well kept on and on and on doing well and didn't pay enough attention to the outsiders and didn't expect those outsiders ever to organize enough or to have figures they could vote for and have been sort of, you know, Congress was complacent, the Democrats were complacent, Remainers were complacent and just thought, yeah, yeah, yeah whatever, they might be discontented but they're never going to actually, you know, overturn the apple cart. So I think it was uh, partly because of that. And I think it's partly too because globalization, as many economists didn't really see at the time, but should have, has profound distributional consequences. It helps some people and it doesn't help others, which is a sort of segue to the thing about London. Uh, I remember during the referendum campaign, one, I can't remember who it was, it was a spokesperson for the Remain campaign who did a press conference and said, well, look, you've got to bear in mind that if we vote to leave the European Union, the city of London will be damaged and house prices will go down, okay? I remember getting a text from a mate of mine from home saying, fantastic, <laughs> you know, that's what we've been trying to achieve for ages, that's good for the country, you know, and, and you're absolutely right, there is an awful lot of resentment about London in this country. I disagree on infrastructure because the point of HS2 in particular is a lot of, tr of intercity trains in this country slow down because they get stuck on tracks behind local services. The point of HS2 is to build the tracks. 
And yes, a side effect of that is to make the trains go faster. I don't really think people in Leeds are suddenly going to say, I can get to Birmingham in 45 minutes, I'm going to go there for lunch. And I don't think many more people are going to go to London because it's prohibitively expensive. But you're right. Uh, but there are two sides to the London story, aren't there? London is very big and London is very powerful. London pays for a lot of the infrastructure that is being built in the rest of the country via tax receipts. So I don't think it's quite as simple as saying we need to do something about London. What we need to do is figure out a way to use the revenue that is generated disproportionately by London, but also by the rest of the country, to make sure that the whole country is able to function, function effectively economically. You want something to be optimistic about? I am profoundly optimistic about the fact that we are talking about things we would never have talked about. Because the, the counterfactual of the Brexit referendum that is seen as obsessing about levelling up isn't some far-sighted government after a Remain vote saying, let's level up the country. It is Cameron and Osborne and 10 more years of austerity that would disproportionately hit the very areas we now think have had a bad deal for 30 years. And I think in that sense, it has been a wake-up call and a good wake-up call for this country. It has made us think about stuff we overlooked for far, too, far, far too long. So in that sense, this has been a reset of our politics, which drifted along a certain course, almost irrespective of the impact it was having on large chunks of this country. And that is a mistake I hope we'll never make again. Okay. Last round of okay. three. So question over there, question over there, and gentlemen here. Yeah, I'd just like to push you on something you said earlier about um, principles. Uh, do you think principles still matter in politics, given that the Conservative Party was so much about austerity and fiscal responsibility for so many years, and then with the budget yesterday, that seemed to just fizzle away. Um, all of a sudden, they're winning seats where they weren't before, and thus fiscal responsibility is no longer relevant. They just need to win the seats again. Okay. Hi. Firstly, thank you. I found it very interesting. Um, so we talked about how um, a lot of the reason that um, more Scots want uh, independence is the, the pro-Europe vote. But what difficulties would you see for Scotland in terms of joining the European Union? And would Spain ever actually veto it because of Catalan? Okay. Thank you. And gentlemen over here. So being a father of two children, being a father of two children, my main concern is obviously about their welfare and their future. What do you think, if any, will be the long-lasting effect of Brexit on the, the impact of children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren of immigrants in this country? Okay. Thank you. I thought you were going to say, as a father of two children, I'm dreading isolation because of COVID and being stuck in the house with them for four weeks. Uh, on the immigration question specifically and attitudes towards immigrants, is that what you were sort of getting at partly? I mean... No, no, but it's, it's, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but what has happened to date has been fascinating because since the referendum, British attitudes towards immigration have shifted massively. So within two years of the referendum, salience of immigration, that's to say the number of people in the public who said it was one of the top issues facing the country, had dropped back to levels we hadn't seen since 2001. Uh, so from 2004 to 2016, immigration was pretty much always in the top three. It fell right out of the top three, wasn't talked about. Think about the 2017 election, no one talked about immigration. Uh, they talked about Brexit, but they didn't talk about immigration. So people don't think immigration is as important as they used to think it was. You can speculate on why that is, but it is absolutely the case in survey after survey after survey. The second thing is the British are now far more positive in terms of their view of the economic and the cultural implications of immigration than they were in 2016. So something has changed. Now we can speculate whether it's because they think we've taken back control so it's problem solved, or whether it's because they've read loads of stories about you know, the NHS being dependent on, NH on immigrants, and so there's an issue. I, I don't know, no one is quite sure what it is. It strikes me as unlikely that loads of fervent Leave voters who don't like immigrants have read the stories in The Guardian about, you know. So, I mean, you know, there are wrinkles in all these sort of theories, but there, something has happened, and it looks to be profound because the trend is pretty solid. Britain is now the most liberal EU state on immigration, according to all the surveys, including, including Pew, and the most tolerant about immigrants. So, something is happening. 
Uh, what happens in the longer term, I don't know. When there's an economic downturn, it quite often leads to hostility against immigrants. If you have something like the migration crisis again, again, that can be used as a trigger. So you're going to get spikes depending on events. You know, attitudes towards immigration are also linked to security issues. Uh, you know, the Muslim community in this country has suffered increases in xenophobia because of terrorism. Uh, so it's impossible to predict, but at the moment, the trend seems to be that uh, the British are becoming more liberal in their attitudes towards immigration. And Boris Johnson's immigration policy is far more liberal than Theresa May's was. Now, whether that's a trend or, I mean, you know, going back to the question over there, God knows if it's a trend because, polit you know, politicians change their spots at every election, as you quite rightly said. And, you know, I'm not saying, it's, I don't think principle is the right word, I think ideology. I mean, I remember, I remember just before the 2017 election reading a piece by Tim Montgomery in The Sun. Now, I liked him. I think he's a great guy, but I very rarely agree with him politically. And he wrote a piece in The Sun saying, this government needs to do three things. It needs to tax people more so that we can help young people get on the housing ladder and stuff. It needs to invest more in the north. And I can't remember what the third thing was. But the striking thing about that article was I read it. I read it three times in the end and thought, I agree with every single word of this article. What the hell is going wrong? Why am I agreeing? And why is the Tory manifesto of 2017 saying there are real dangers with free markets and the state needs to control them? And I was thinking, this is a Labour manifesto. So you're right, things are changing. Whether it's a permanent state of affairs, I don't know. Whether everything will eventually swing back after sort of, if Brexit ceases to be an issue in our politics, and that's a big issue in our politics, whether the Brexit divide sort of subsides now because we're out of the European Union or whether that values divide continues to determine political choices. But we live in a world where you, I, mean, I had to get used to saying things like Labour won Kensington, the Tories won Stoke. I mean, things you would never, you know, the Tories won Wakefield, where I come from, which I never thought I'd have. You know, it's a, it's a new political era. And what I don't know is to what extent the parties have arrived at a final destination. I think not, to be honest. But we are in a weird situation now where we're going to spend four years watching a Labour party say, but that's fiscally irresponsible. This is, you know, that used to be Corbyn's party. And we're going to see a Conservative party saying, well, actually, you know, we're not listening to business because this is about politics. It, you know, so you're absolutely right, but I don't know what the answer to your question is. The Spanish have intimated that they wouldn't block Sp uh, Scottish accession. But, I mean, that's not worth anything because it depends what's happening when the Scots apply for accession. The one thing I will say about Scotland is they will not get the kind of special deal that Northern Ireland got. And they won't get the sort of special deal that Northern Ireland got because Northern Ireland, A, was an issue for an existing member state. It was a vital interest for the Republic, which meant the EU was willing to be flexible. And the EU is also a signatory to the Good Friday Agreement, so they had a special responsibility to preserving the status quo on the island of Ireland. And those factors will be absent from Scotland. So if there are those in Scotland who are thinking, yeah, we'll get a deal, and they'll allow us to fudge the border with England, no, they won't. They absolutely will not. And so that is a choice that they're going to have to make. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for engaging so well with this. Um, just wanted to say one thing. Uh, we've actually got a reception upstairs at the Terrace Cafe. Uh, so please do join us for any further questions. How long are mm -hmm. you staying with us for today, Anand? Until I start dozing off in about 10 minutes. Fab. OK, <laughs> 10 minutes then. Uh, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Thank you. Thanks so much.